So welcome everyone to uh, week 14 of Old Testament Prophets 2 here on Monday nights. And uh, our next of the last class, next Monday night will be our last class. And I'll say it again right now, uh, anybody in the Houston area that could join us in person for the closing celebration Thursday evening, May 2nd at 7 p.m. down in League City, that would be wonderful. Um, of course, you. I hope you saw the email by by now. Uh, I could have gone to your junk folder, but it went out in constant contact, so they have a better chance of getting to everybody's inbox than just sending from our SHBI account. But if you need information, didn't see it, let me know, and I'll be glad to forward that to you. The you the YouTube live stream link is in there because some of you I know are further away and will just join that that way. But Susan and I will be there a week Thursday night. So Cornell's going to pray for us as we uh, get ready to to start. So. If you would, Cornell, just asking the Lord's blessings on our study and needs of everyone represented here, and we will get going. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we first and foremost acknowledge you for being God Almighty all by yourself. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be in the midst of this educational service, Heavenly Father, just to study your word. And that, Heavenly Father, it would just be moved by your spirit, Heavenly Father, guided by your hand, Heavenly Father, but most of all, touched by everyone here. We ask you to bless Brother Kirk, Heavenly Father. He's labored for this word, and Heavenly Father, for this educational moment, Heavenly Father, to teach us. Um, but thus says the Lord, Heavenly Father, that has been written down over time and passed down from generation to generation that we receive it, Heavenly Father, according to your will, your way, Heavenly Father. And as you move today, Heavenly Father, we ask a special blessing over each and every one of us, Heavenly Father. We don't know everyone's situation or circumstance, but you do, Heavenly Father, for you are omnipresent, Heavenly Father. And we know that you know the hairs that are numbered on our head. And we ask that, Heavenly Father, you bless everyone in their situations, their circumstance, Heavenly Father. And we lift up uh, Trey and uh, Charlene, as they're about to uh, bring forth life, Heavenly Father, the gift of life in a baby. And we ask mm -hmm. your special blessings and covering over them, Lord God, as only you could do. For you know every yes. situation, Heavenly Father, you formed and made this situation for thus such a day, Heavenly Father. And we give you honor, glory, and praise in advance, Heavenly Father, for a beautiful and wonderful experience by them, Heavenly Father, to bring forth mm -hmm. the gift of life for their baby. It's mm -hmm. in Jesus' name, Lord God, we thank you for all these blessings. We thank you for your covering. But most of all, we thank you for the opportunity to grow and to know you more intimately. It's in Christ's name, sake, we thank you, praise you, and say, amen. 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 Thank you, Cornell. Thank you so much. It matters to pray, and it, it's important to invite the Lord, his spirit, into our presence when we study. It, it makes a difference. Jesus, in Luke eleven thirteen, will not the Father give the Spirit to those who ask? And as I understand it in the Greek there, it is not a one-time asking. It's not punctilier, one point in time. It's like a continuous present to those who keep on asking. And so we always daily need to ask the Lord to grace us with his Spirit. That's, that's at the heart of Jesus' prayer. The Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. We need it every day, and we need to ask every day for it. So it just puts our hearts in a posture to receive more from the Lord when we begin that way and have that kind of a open posture, open-handed posture before the Lord. All right, well, we will cover tonight We'll be hitting highlights in uh, Haggai, uh, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, maybe get into the first part of Zechariah, and then next week finish Zechariah and Malachi. Um, we 
did we finished up uh, Nahum or Nahum last week and so we began with Habakkuk I want to go ahead and use the videos uh, they're not real long here on uh, you know these smaller books so let's start with Habakkuk Habakkuk The book of the prophet Habakkuk. He lived during the final decades of Israel's southern kingdom, and it was a time of injustice and idolatry. He saw the rising threat of Babylon on the horizon, and that was not good news for anybody. But unlike the other prophets, Habakkuk does not accuse Israel. He doesn't even speak on God's behalf to the people. Rather, all of his words are addressed personally to God. And the book tells about Habakkuk's personal struggle, his journey of trying to believe that God is good when there is so much evil and tragedy in the world. And so Habakkuk's words are actually poems of lament, and they're very similar to the laments that you find in the book of Psalms. The poet lodges a complaint and then draws God's attention to suffering or injustice in the world, demanding that God do something. And knowing about this lament form, it's actually the key to understanding the design and message of this short book. Chapters 1 and 2 are framed as a back-and-forth argument between Habakkuk and God. And the prophet lodges two complaints to which God offers two responses. His first complaint is that life in Israel has become horrible. The Torah is neglected, resulting in violence and injustice, and it's all being tolerated by Israel's corrupt leaders. And Habakkuk, he's crying out, asking God to do something, but nothing seems to change. But then all of a sudden, God responds. He says that he's very aware of the corruption of his own people, Israel, and that he's summoning the armies of Babylon to bring down his justice on Israel. And very similar to the message of Micah or Isaiah, God says he will use this terrifying empire to devour Israel because of their injustice and evil. But Habakkuk has a problem with this answer, and so he offers his second complaint. He says Babylon is even worse than Israel. They're more corrupt, they're more violent, they've deified their own military power, they treat humans like animals, gathering them up like fish in a net, he says. They devour nations and people groups in order to build their own empire. And so Habakkuk says, how can you, a holy, good God, use such corrupt nations as your instruments in history? He demands an explanation. In fact, he depicts himself as a watchman on the city walls waiting for God's response, which eventually comes. God tells Habakkuk to get out some tablets and chisel and write down what he sees and hears. It's a vision about an appointed time in the future that even though it may seem slow in coming, it will eventually come. In fact, God says that the righteous person will live by their faith in this hope and vision. So what is this divine promise that Habakkuk is supposed to write down? It's that God will bring Babylon down. God says that the violence and oppression of the nations creates this never-ending cycle of revenge and that God will use this cycle to bring about the rise and fall of nations. And the fact that God might for a time use a corrupt nation like Babylon does not mean that he endorses everything that they do. He holds all nations accountable to his justice. And so Babylon will fall along with any other nation that acts like them. God's promise is then elaborated by a series of five woes that describe the kinds of oppression and injustice that's perpetrated by nations like Babylon. The first two target unjust economic practices, like how wealthy people will charge ridiculous interest just to keep poor people in debt, and so they build their wealth through crooked means. The third woe is a critique of slave labor, treating humans like animals and threatening them with violence if they don't produce. The fourth woe targets the abuse of alcohol by irresponsible leaders. While people are suffering under their bad leadership, they're partying and wasting their money on sex and booze. And the last woe exposes the idolatry, the engine that drives such nations. They have made money and power and national security into their gods, offering these allegiance at all costs. And so people become slaves to their own national empire. Now, the practices described here aren't unique to Babylon, but that's part of the point. Given the human condition, most nations eventually become Babylon. And so this is how God's answer to Habakkuk in this book becomes God's answer to all later generations, to anyone who lives in a world ruled by other Babylons. 
But it leaves the question hanging. Is God going to let this cycle, the rise and fall of Babylon-like empires, go on forever? And that question is what chapter 3 is about. We're told that this is a prayer of Habakkuk, and it begins by Habakkuk pleading with God to act now in the present like he has in the past in bringing down corrupt nations. And what follows is a very ancient poem. It first describes a powerful, terrifying appearance of God. It's very similar to the opening poems of Micah and Nahum, and similar to the appearance of God at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. There's cloud and fire and earthquake. When the Creator shows up to confront human evil, everybody will be paying attention. Habakkuk then goes on to describe this future defeat of evil as a future exodus. So just like God came as a warrior and he split the sea in his battle against Pharaoh, Habakkuk says that God will once more bring his judgment down on the head of the evil house. So Pharaoh, like Babylon, has become here an archetype of violent human nations. But at the same time, we're told that when God confronts evil, he will save his people and his anointed one. It's a reference to the king from the line of David. And so in this poem, the Exodus story of the past has become an image of the future Exodus God will perform. He will once again defeat evil and bring down the pharaohs and the Babylons of this world. He'll bring justice to all people and rescue the oppressed and the innocent. And it's this hope that enables Habakkuk to conclude the book with hopeful praise. Even if the world's falling apart with food shortage or drought or war or whatever, he will choose trust and joy in the covenant promises of God. And so Habakkuk, by the end of this book, becomes a shining example of how the righteous live by faith. Habakkuk recognizes just how dark and chaotic the world and our lives can become. And he invites us into a journey of faith, of trusting that God loves this world more than we do, and that he will one day deal with its evil. And that's what the book of Habakkuk is all about. Right. Yeah, it's very good. Um, <clears throat> let me get over to that. So, uh, Anything that uh, grabbed your attention as we uh, went through that? And no problem if you don't have anything right now. Um, something You may have something as we go on, but always like to give an opportunity. Probably didn't realize that there was so much going on, right, in the little book of Habakkuk, that it was so relevant to us. Uh, I trust you uh, catch the part here that's particularly uh, applicable to us throughout the ages. Most nations eventually become Babylon. They become empires that oppress and Historically, that has been true, even regardless of some of the, the some having better foundations than others in the beginning. And it speaks to us. God speaks to us here. We'll look at a few verses that uh, will help us to help strengthen our faith um, and to where we reach the point, I think, of mature faith that Habakkuk demonstrates at the end. So uh, just, uh, you know, have your Bibles open. Of course, I'll bring it up here, uh, a few of the verses on, on the screen, Habakkuk. Uh, initially, you could think that Habakkuk is, uh, you know, you might not say weak in his faith, but he's complaining to the Lord. And I just want us to see how, common that is in scripture we had job doing a lot of that we see that in some of the psalms as they mentioned psalm 73 is one that looks at the injustice around the basically the psalmist in psalm 73 saying god it seems to me like you bless the wicked and you curse the righteous you make it hard on the righteous and uh, so jeremiah struggles with that. Uh, Job, Jeremiah, Habakkuk here, the psalmist, we have it in numerous places. Um, and so uh, 
his cry, how long, Lord, must I call for help? But you don't listen. He doesn't just say, how long do I have to call out? He's saying, you're not listening. Um, and don't you see you know, that is similar? Remember, for those of you in the Revelation class, uh, Revelation 6, um, it would be verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been killed because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? And of course, he speak, they speak of vengeance, which we know the blood of Jesus is not one of vengeance, but forgiveness. We see that in Hebrews, but still, this cry from the martyrs, How long? How long must we wait? And in case you're not in the Revelation class, then each of them, verse 11, was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer in the unsettling thing until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Wow. You know, so that carries on to us today and have mentioned in that class and I'm probably having this one more martyrs over the last 40 years than all of church history combined in the last 2000. So this is still being carried out and we need to keep this in mind. If we have, if we have a theology that says, or we've heard from someone that as, as people of God, our faith is triumphant. We, we won't be subject to, these things we may be pulled out of, could be raptured out of this, these difficult situations. Just see what scripture says to us. God is saying to them here, wait, there are more who will die uh, for my sake. Uh, and then he will wrap things up. Well, so it's a similar cry to Habakkuk here. How long must I call for help? Verse 4, the law is paralyzed, justice never prevails. So, you know, we can sometimes we complain about things, how bad things can be, say, in America now. And just understand that's that's what we need to remember is what Tim Mackey said there. This is not unique. This has happened throughout history. Um God's, God answers Habakkuk, but it applies to us today. Uh, this is probably one of, uh, certainly as far as kind of like Revelation relevant to us uh, today. So God answers. And then his answer is not what Habakkuk's expecting. Uh, he says here in verse Five, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. Uh, goes on and talks about how, you know, and he doesn't, God doesn't condone this behavior, their arrogance, their violence, their being merciless. Uh, but he says, I'm going to raise them up and he will use them to punish Judah, because this is written uh, after the northern kingdom, Israel, has been destroyed. This is about 625, 606. 606, you might remember, is the first uh, wave of captives taken by the Babylonians to Babylon. And Daniel was probably in that first wave in 606, and then 596, and then they destroyed it uh, in 586, so 20 years in between. Habakkuk, second complaint, is basically, God, how can you, a holy God, use such a, a treacherous and ruthless people? Are you not from everlasting? My God, my holy one, uh, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous uh, as Tim Mackey said they basically Habakkuk's basically saying they're worse than than Israel. They're worse than Judah. 
how can you do that? Well, you go on. Please feel free, any of you at any point, if you have something that you want to uh, share, go to chapter two. Back at still talking here at the first part of two, I will stand at my watch, station myself. I will look to see what they will say, what answer I'm to give to this to complaint. The Lord replies, write down the revelation, make it plain, for it awaits an appointed time. Uh, so it linger, wait for it, it will come and not delay. Similar to Second Peter 3, you know, where Peter says, scoffers uh, have said, where is this second coming of Jesus? It's been all this time. And of course, Peter was only writing, you know, 40 years later. Here we are 2,000 years later. God says, wait for it. It will come. Yes, Drake. Uh, just just uh, taking a, a swipe at, at this. Um, you know, uh, what I, I comes to my mind is that God's timing is not our timing. Uh, number one, um, it shows the the graciousness of God and the patience of God. Um, even when uh, we see all the evil going on, uh, when you read the scripture in Revelations of uh, the righteous uh, being uh, put to death, uh, mortars in one sense, uh, I think that God is allowing uh, mankind to uh, have an opportunity or chance to see how wicked things are can get and begin to pray because <laughs> you can't ride with too much of that evil and wickedness for a long time. At some point, uh, I believe it's going to cause you to turn your face to God uh, uh, and, and, and pray as Habakkuk was doing. He was, he was praying, uh, asking yeah. God to intervene. He certainly turned to the right one that could do anything about the situation, which, which was God. Yeah. That's all I have. Yeah. That's, that's, no, what that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and it's true. And while we talk about, let me go here, I've mentioned it, but I want to keep it, uh, uh, in front of us. Um, I say that I think I have it right here in the prophets or revelation um it may be i know i've got it in i wasn't going to pull up but let me go ahead and uh open up outlook here because i do have it right there because it's an important reminder to us here um what we've noted before the fruit of light and darkness mature alongside each other. Uh, the one, remember this one, the one writing in the 1800s. It's not evils getting the upper hand or that, uh, that good is eclipsing evil yet until Christ's return. The fruit of light and darkness mature alongside each other. As, and be sure we don't understand that to mean that Satan is the equal and opposite of God. He's not. He's a created being. Uh, but while we see the, the, you know, evil in our world, let's be aware, let's constantly remind ourselves the fruit of light is maturing as well. And that again accounts for, though the number of martyrs is greater than any point in history, at the same time, the church is growing in unprecedented ways among some very resistant peoples, Muslims, uh, you know, in, in China, though it's being forced underground again. And so uh, the fruit of light is growing and maturing at the same time because we need that. We, we need to know God is at work in our world. We need to continue to join him. We need to, we don't hold up and take a bunker mentality, but we continue to, to let our light shine in dark places because uh, eventually darkness will have to give to the light 
the light will overcome darkness. And we have Jesus' promise in Matthew 16, 18 and following. The gates of hell will not be able to stand against the onslaught of the gospel. We will set prisoners free. So do, do keep that in, in mind. But that doesn't mean anything that you said, uh, Drake. That's, that's good. It's just a reminder that, uh, yes, darkness increases, but so does the fruit of light. Now look at verse four. This one's huge. So he did, he's, he God admits the Babylonians they're arrogant, puffed up. His desires are not upright. So in the face of evil, what's a person to do? What's a godly person to do? But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness or by his faith. So that's huge because that's quoted three times. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17 by Paul, and then again in Galatians, that's verse 17 actually, uh, Romans 1, 17, Galatians 3, 11, and then Hebrews 10, 38, which may or may not be Paul, it doesn't matter who wrote Hebrews. Uh, so three times Habakkuk 2, 4 is quoted. So let's don't miss the impact of this in all ages, in the face of empires, in the face of when evil seems to have the upper hand, how do God's people respond? By faith in God. We, it doesn't mean we will never, you know, wake inside, shake inside a little bit that, it doesn't mean, oh, man, we're like a rock immovable. Nothing, nothing phases me. You know, we're human. Yes, we're going to feel the adrenaline rush. Yes, we're going to feel some fear at times because the most common command in Scripture, don't be afraid. God knows we struggle with that. And so, but our response is to be by faith. And I just want us all in, in a person of faith again, is not hiding him or herself, you know, in their bunker, in their hole in the ground. Person of faith keeps doing, carrying out the commission Jesus gave in Matthew 28, make disciples. A person of faith keeps doing what Jesus said in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, 5, 13 through 16. Continue to let your light shine, be Saul. So that's the way that a faithful person lives. Yes, Austin. Paul writes as a reminder for us too in Galatians that do not be deceived. Uh, God cannot be mocked, that we will reap what we sow and whoever sows to please the flesh will reap from the flesh and, and so on. And that's a good reminder too, as we remain faithful that God is not being deceived. So I know that Habakkuk is asking these questions and 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 he's reminding us to be faithful, but we also know that that uh, they're not deceiving God. He sees all and he knows all. Yeah. No, that's good. Yes, that's a good reminder. And in and and God responds, you know, with such through it throughout here, even here in verse four, when he acknowledges, no, you know, that doesn't mean the Babylonians are right and just, uh, but in the face of that evil and that's the biggest takeaway i want for all of us is to come away like we'll hear habakkuk in the end that he is a faith-filled person obviously that means he still had his questions his complaints but in the final analysis he leans on his trust in god and uh that's that's what i want us to see i have a statement some teacher made here uh trust or faith is needed when we don't understand or see things clearly you know if if we understand the situation perfectly well perfectly clearly it's like it's almost sight and so we understand from hebrews you know that Faith will turn into sight when Jesus returns. There's no longer the role of faith whenever we see Jesus. That is one of the reasons Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 
you know, faith, hope, and love, you know, these are all great. The greatest is love because faith and hope uh, will, will be culminated. They, they will no longer be needed when faith becomes sight, when we see Jesus. But love will always, over even into new creation, love will, will be essential. It will be core to the whole character of God. First John 4, 8, God is love. So in new creation, God will still be love. So love outlasts faith and hope and just be encouraged by that. Uh, and I and I still encourage us all to, if we tend to have the language of talking about how bad and things are getting, to try to turn that, uh, because that doesn't build anyone up. It only adds to this kind of feeling of, 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 uh, of things being dismal and dark and maybe hopeless. And things are never hopeless, no matter how dark. And I say that realizing how terribly dark some things can get, like uh, Corey Ten Boom in the in the uh, concentration camps in World War II. I know it can be extremely dark for people, but the righteous person uh, will continue to live by his faith. So please take heart, be encouraged by that. Uh, okay. Go on. Somebody, um, yeah, this Cornell. I yeah, happy to be able to join y'all. <laughs> I had to drive home, but I oh, was listening okay. as I was listening, and I couldn't get off the birthing process as you talked about revealing, uh, revealing to us that uh, you're about to to bring forth. Uh, family's about to have no. a child brought forth to light, and um, when you was talking about the vision and the word, and I could thinking about God birthing the word in us. Mm -hmm. As we come to class, we're receiving that word. And he talks about a vision. And we often, often think about what God is going to give us for us personally. But his word is also personable for us. And he bursts that word inside of us as he makes it plain for us. He makes it open for us. He makes it receiving for us if we yield ourselves to it. And yeah. if we we're studying it and writing it down and getting understanding from him, then he will bring forth that which he put in us and bring it forth to light that he's talking about in verse yeah. four. And then during that dark time, we can be that light. And as you were just saying, be that be that disciple to others to yeah. share that was birthed to us to birth it and plant the seed within them for new birth and new mm -hmm. light creation to come from them as they receive what thus says the Lord that was birthing us. Yeah. So that was just yeah. something in me that I was driving uh, and I was listening to you, but I couldn't get it out of my mind, yeah. but I wanted to share. No, that's good. Thank you for sharing that, Cornell. And, I, you know, I'd like to springboard off of that um, and to say when we're talking about the word, I want to keep it before us that we, we realize, yes, there is in this written word, God uses it uh, but uh, to help us. And we're using it right now to study. So it is an integral part of our, of our walk with the Lord. But let's, let's always remember that even the, the greater manifestation or revelation of God, of the word of God is Jesus Christ himself. Now, this helps point us to Jesus, John 5, 39. So we need this, uh, but ultimately this word, and when you were talking about the word being birthed in our hearts, I pray that we're all thinking, yes, God uses this as we study it to help birth the living word, the word of God, Jesus Christ, because we have, yes, John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And when he's doing that, of course, he's not talking about the written word. It didn't come along until thousands of years later and it is the the living word uh, of god in in jesus christ that uh, comes to life in our hearts and it's him that we follow whether we're looking at this here in habakkuk or we're studying towards the end of the story in revelation go on down here and a little bit more in um 
of course, uh, this applies to corporations, people, individual employers today. Woe to him who built this house by unjust gain. So that happened then. It still happens now, not paying workers their fair wages. 14, look at this. Uh, it's a companion verse to Isaiah 6. Uh, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Um, so you have a future tense. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So in these last days, the earth continues to be filled with the knowledge of God. Now, see, there's so much that happens in our world that we think we, we, we don't realize that some of these things our fulfillments are being fulfilled today. We maybe tend to think, well, that will only happen when Christ, after Christ returns. But no, it is happening today. So we have a partial fulfillment. Sure, there is an ultimate fulfillment coming with Christ return. But this is happening as people, we prayed for Muslims during Ramadan. And millions of Muslims are coming to faith in Christ. So. The earth is being filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord today. Uh, and so it continues to happen. Then back to Isaiah 6, the creature surrounding the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full. Present tense, the earth is full of his glory. <clears throat> so even now, and the earth will continue to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of, of the Lord uh, and then, of course, when he returns, new creation, as we'll see, new heavens, new earth, then it will it will be ultimately fulfilled. But uh, be be encouraged by that. The two fourteen, it is it is happening today. Look at the end of two. These are there's two another companion verse to Psalm forty six. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him so i think of that often whenever i know i'll think of it maybe quoted uh in my heart when i'm being still before the lord psalm 46 10 be still and know that i am god habakkuk 220 the lord is in his holy temple let the earth be silent god's temple is not in jerusalem what does paul say in first corinthians 6 13 do you not know that your body and you, plural, not just us individually, yes, us individually, but corporately, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? God's temple is not one of stone today. It doesn't, he's not waiting to rebuild that in Jerusalem someday. His First Peter 2 says we are temples being built, we are living stones being built into a temple. But understand the beauty of silence at times. Observe some silence in your life. You don't have to be running down a prayer list. You don't have to be reading, thinking in, in your, quote, quiet time or devotional time. It doesn't have to be filled with all of your activity of studying and verbalizing requests. Some of it needs to just be being silent before God. You're God, I'm not. And just be still and rest in his presence. And I'll often verbalize, I pray for the needs of the whole world in this silence. So keep those two coupled together. Uh, Psalm 4610, this one. Uh, Jesus got away to quiet and lonely places. Well, as we go on to wrap up, I'm back at probably spending more here than the others. It's just so good and relevant for us. Uh, we go on to the end. So back Habakkuk's faith-filled response I heard and my heart pounded 316 uh, my lips quivered at the sound decay crept in my bones my legs trembled 
Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. The fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet well, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. You recognize that. Uh, Hinds feet on high places and such. Uh, so a huge statement of faith. Though economically things are difficult, so props for them, you know, they lived close to the land. For us, it would be like, you know, maybe think back to uh, COVID and some empty shelves. Though, you know, can't find what I need in the supermarket or those of you in the all of, and we were there too in Houston during Harvey and you remember uh, bare shelves. Okay. So even when the shelves are bare uh, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my savior. So right in the midst of some of the difficult times, the chaos that we go through, we need to remember this and keep uh, keep resting in and giving thanks in the Lord. That doesn't mean uh, to be giddy with happiness, but joy is something deeper. Joy that that is intertwined with pain and suffering. And, and he admits, and what I said, sometimes our hearts will pound. Uh, you know, our legs will tremble, and that's understandable. That's okay. But we do what Habakkuk did, even though, even still, I will do, I will rejoice in the Lord. You don't, you don't wait until you feel like it. You do it because it's right. In the midst of hardship, I give thanks to you, Father. I remind myself uh, constantly, 95-year-old Grandma Johnson, not my grandma, but I have more blessings than problems. It's always true. I have more blessings than problems, no matter if things are in a mess around us in our nation. This is our faith-filled response. God is our strength, not our economy, not our military, my, not even just our our nuclear families or those close to us, uh, ultimately the Lord has to be the strength of our hearts, our portion forever. Any thoughts, reflections here as we wrap up Habakkuk? All right. Let's uh, go on. Zephaniah won't, it's not uh, too long. It's written close to the same time as Habakkuk, um, just before the first uh, invasion of Jerusalem by Babylon. Yes, Drake. I'm sorry, Kirk. Uh, uh, I, I did want to um, make, make this statement on uh now Habakkuk is praying out of Judea, right? He's this is before uh, Judea that had fallen, right? So, so yes, you're right. He's uh, he's 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 speaking these things uh, in time of <clears throat> God having blessed uh, the nation to uh, have received the the land. They they were. Uh, more than likely uh, uh, prosperous, uh, and and the, the blessings were upon them. But uh, it, it definitely shows when a, a a nation decides, I'm going to take God's blessings, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna need Him to lead me or guide me. I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna. Well, it, it even boils down to our lives again. You know, I made that same mistake again. Uh, right. you, know, you can kick God out uh, after he has, has blessed you, after you have become prosperous, 
and um, more or less, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm I'm trying to say, look at the results of of kicking God out. How the nation had had mm-hmm. gotten where they had all the violence and and uh, this was Habakkuk's burden and seeing all the trouble and pain. Uh, and I'll just leave it alone when I say. Uh, I can remember a time when uh, we grew up in schools. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a baby boomer. And we started our day with a prayer and a pledge of allegiance to the flag. And about the most we would get out of that day would maybe be somebody get into a fist fight. <laughs> that was the most yeah. that we gotten. But it seems like when um, we decided that prayer could no longer be in school and uh to me, it's like kicking God out. And and the results now yeah. is way more devastating. Uh, now we got guns coming in. Now we're getting classrooms shot up. So just yeah. you know, the thought that when we kick God out, when we're blessed, yeah. uh, we have to be cautious of that, taking God's blessings and then. Yeah. Not wanting him, the giver of the blessings. Yes. Yeah. No, that's good, Drake. Thank you. And uh, I think a helpful picture there, uh, I heard it articulated by uh, by some kind of since 9-11, that maybe the big picture of what we see, uh, we, it's easy for us to think, well, God is zapping the nation with these problems because of their disobedience. And maybe a more accurate picture uh, is... Um, because I w- I'm not forgetting it, but I'm just wanting to remember there was there was an exact phrase, but I'll get it'll come back. A, m- a more accurate picture is God is grieved when he's a gentleman. And when we repeatedly say, thankfully, he doesn't leave the first time we turn our backs on him. But when we habitually turn our backs on God, he's a gentleman. He never forces himself on us. Uh, he will turn away. Yeah. And so when he turns his face away, Amen. then in a sense, you can say all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Uh, what I was trying to remember was James 1, 13, and, you know, in the fact that God, you know, God doesn't, doesn't do the zapping and the sending down lightning bolts of punishment. James 1, 13, every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights and uh, if God just turns his face away, because we have that picture throughout scripture, the priestly blessing and and uh, the blessing from Aaron, the priestly blessing in number 6, 22, 23, may the Lord turn his face towards you. And let me just pull up one quick psalm to give you. And it just, it's just, it's an important image that comes to mind as you were talking great because it matters how we view what god is doing so in psalm 10 won't take me long oh god four five one oh four so let me uh go there Uh, he's talking about nature, God feeding even the uh, waters, the mountains. He makes grass grow for the cat- cattle, trees are well. Uh, he just talks about uh, how many are your works, O Lord. 27, all creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. But look at verse 29, 104, 29. When you hide your face, they are terrified. Mm-hmm. and that's all that god wow has to do mm-hmm. it's when the light you know again keep in mind i did i don't want to lose go go from this but when keep the image when you hide your face mm-hmm. if you turn your face away creation is terrified darkness comes in like a flood all hell breaks loose Amen. So that's that's all I think really that's what happens with God because look at uh, uh, Numbers 6 mentioning he said to bless them this way 
tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless them. And you know it. The Lord bless you and keep you out loud. And the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face away from you. Wow. Or toward you and give you peace. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to earn. We can't ever be good enough to earn. Okay, God, I've been a good boy. You turn your face towards me. No, it's his grace. Yes. But we live in the confidence of that grace because of what Jesus has done. So even if a nation is suffering and a nation as a whole has turned its face away, yes, we as citizens of that nation will feel the effects of some of that. We will suffer some of the things that happen to a nation or to a broken world, thus COVID and some you know Christians dying from COVID. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of darkness in our land, we can still have the face of God upon us mm. and that's we just live with humility not an arrogance not that i deserve it mm. and there a sense of entitlement is the death of discipleship anytime a person feels like i'm entitled to this mm. that that's that's dangerous ground but i just want to i wanted to give you i saw that image of the beauty and the light that comes from the face of god being turned and then if god Grief out of grief turns away, like he, we hear him in the prophets. My, you know, my heart is torn within me, Ephraim. God's saying, "I'm, you, you don't know how this breaks my heart." And it's, it's in that kind when he turns his face away. Assyria comes in like a mm -hmm. flood and overruns Israel. Mm -hmm. When he has to do that to Jerusalem, the Babylonians come in and overrun. And so it's happened throughout history, but we we can have the peace and confidence that we keep. We we like Habakkuk in the midst of darkness. We live by faith. And so we still know that we have strength from the Lord's face. So I hope that's helpful. That's just been helpful oh, yeah. to me. Beautiful. The last that was go that ahead. Was wonderful. Yeah, that that definitely points out how just you know. Uh, I thought about nine one one when that happened in our nation, and then uh, we were we were um, back to uh, well, you know, God bless America, you know, when we we're gonna <laughs> looks like we were gonna you know seek out revenge, but in my mind I was saying, well, God has blessed America, but is but what is America doing with God's blessings, and yeah. how we living? You know, and <clears throat> like you said, Kirk, uh, the, the Bible, uh, James say all good and perfect gifts come from God. God seems that, like he just steps out of the room. And when he just, when you kick him out, when you tell him, I, I don't want you here, uh, he he's a gentleman. And and, yeah. and he just seems to, to step, step out. Now, I'm leaving it alone. But in one of the shooting incidents we had, uh, and there were some elementary kids, a very sad situation, Make, makes us all go to our knees and pray, just like Habakkuk. It was a burden as we saw, what, as Habakkuk saw all the violence going on. And yeah. the parents asked the question, they said, well, uh, where was God? Where was, where was God when this happened? And, and, <clears throat> Again, it hit my mind, and uh, I mean, you know, I've made my mistakes in life too. I don't judge them, but it's it it was a reflection of my life as well, and said, "Well, God is where you put him. You you told him to leave, you told him to go, and you didn't want prayer in the school. So yeah. here's the results. He stepped out of the room, did as you said. So and I and I would and I would tweak what I said there just a little bit. I I wanted to bring this up. Uh, we'll have to carry on, but Isaiah thirty. Uh, people can literally do that. So the this was the Northern Kingdom, probably both Northern and Southern Kingdom, saying, uh, telling Isaiah, you know, stop doing this, get off this path, stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Well, that's about as blatant as you can get. Wow. God, we won't, no, we we don't want anymore. And these were religious. Wow. Remember, these were the religious leaders. Religious leaders can get to that point. They're doing fine on their own, thank you. There's yeah. money, sex, and power. They don't need God. That can happen today. Mm -hmm. But 
so it can be that that blatant which is better it's it's better to you know to show your hand uh at, at least you couldn't confront them in this sense of hypocrisy not that they're they're not saying oh god god come and bless us and then they're saying get you know get out of here they're they're out they're up front about it stop confronting us and then i just wanted to say at the same time when i talk about god turning his face uh, we, of course, all of our, all of our metaphors and, uh, images break down at some point with God, because he's not, he's not finite like we are. So we have to realize they only go so far, turning his face away only goes so far, uh, and leaving only goes so far because the question is asked, where was God during 9-11, you know, and, and many, a good teacher has said he was there in the towers, with those who were making their last call to their families saying goodbye. He was there in the burning towers because where is God on Calvary? The darkest, you can't get any darker on earth, not literally, but spiritually than at Jesus's crucifixion. Where, where was God? He was on the cross. Yes. And I, I want us to have that clearly in mind. You know, in a sense, we can think of God abandoning us. God weeps with us, and he's in the brokenness with us. We know he is. He is Emmanuel. Jesus says in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, make disciples, and I am with you always to the end. Amen. And Isaiah 43, when you go through the fire, when you go through the water, I am there. So, Let's 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 try and and again, this isn't just for you, Drake. This is for myself yeah, that's, too. That's rich. <laughs> yeah, it, it's rich. for all of us. Mm -hmm. Let's let's try to catch our thinking of God has abandoned us. Mm -hmm. No, God weeps. He's there, and he is. He never breaks his word. He is Emmanuel always. Mm -hmm. He's with us. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the power of darkness. Jesus said there in the garden. He says, I was teaching all the time in the day, daylight. Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? Well, he knew why they were afraid of the crowds. But he says, go ahead, because this is the hour of darkness. Darkness has the upper hand right now. So even with God present, you know, there, there can be times where darkness has the upper hand, but he's still there. He hasn't run out on us. Yes. So, yes. So. Oh, I pray that's help. that's helpful for all of us. Amen. Well, let oh, that's the wrong one. This is the one I want. Uh, some of these others, we get a good synopsis of Zeph Zephaniah mainly. I think there's about one verse I'll point out in Zephaniah, but let's go ahead with, let's see how long this one is. Five minutes. The book of the prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah lived during the final decades of the southern kingdom of Judah. It was when King Josiah had attempted to bring about real change in the land by removing idols and restoring the temple to the worship of Israel's God alone. But Israel was just too far gone. Worshiping other gods was too entrenched in the life of the people. And it ended up that Josiah's pride led him to a tragic death on the battlefield as he set Jerusalem on a collision course with Babylon. And Zephaniah, he had seen all of this coming. For years, he had been warning the leaders of Jerusalem. And this little book is a collection of his poetry summarizing his message. It's designed to have three main parts. The first focuses on the day of the Lord's judgment coming on Judah and Jerusalem. The second part is about the day of the Lord's judgment on the nations and Jerusalem again. And then the third section explores the hope that remains for the nations and for Jerusalem on the other side of God's judgment. The first section opens with the shocking reversal of Genesis 1. So God's good, ordered world is going to descend back into disorder and darkness and chaos, becoming uninhabitable once again. And as you keep reading, you realize Zephaniah is developing all of these powerful poetic images to describe how Jerusalem's world is going to end. All of the city's institutions for worshiping the gods of the Canaanites will be destroyed. All the leaders who perpetrated injustice, all the economic centers where crooked lending and borrowing took place, all of it will be gone along with the city's walls. Stephaniah develops these almost apocalyptic images to show the significance of what's going to happen. It all 
refers to a great army that is coming to take out Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting that Zephaniah never mentions whose army God's going to use to bring this judgment. Now, we know from the other prophets, Micah or Habakkuk, that it's Babylon. But Zephaniah never mentions that. And it's because he wants to highlight God's role in orchestrating the rise and fall of the city. And actually, that's what gives Zephaniah hope. Not that Jerusalem as a whole can avoid its fate, but in the closing poem of section one, he calls on anyone in Jerusalem who would seek the Lord. And he says, these will make up the faithful remnant, the people who could be spared if they repent. In the second section, Zephaniah widens his focus to include the nations around Judah. So the Philistines or Moabites, the Ammonites, even the Assyrians, he accuses all of them of corruption and violence and arrogance, and he predicts that all of them will fall before Babylon too. And what's shocking is that the final people group targeted in this section are the Israelites in Jerusalem. It's like the leaders and prophets and priests of Israel are so corrupt and violent, so estranged from their God, that he doesn't even recognize them as his people anymore. And so this section ends with God's final decision. He says he's going to gather up all the nations, including Jerusalem, and pour out his burning indignation. God's justice becomes this consuming fire that devours evil from the land, which is really intense. And so the following line that brings us into the final part of the book comes as a total surprise. We discover that this burning fire of divine judgment is not aimed at destroying people. Rather, its purpose is to purify the nations, including Jerusalem. So the section begins as God says that he's going to heal and transform the rebellious nations into one unified family. And that after being purified, they're going to turn from their evil and call upon the name of the Lord. These images point to the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, that God would find a way to bless the nations and Jerusalem as well. The conclusion of the book focuses on the restoration of the city at the center of the nations. God's presence is there in the restored city, along with that faithful remnant that's been humbled and transformed by God's mercy. And they're called to sing and rejoice. And then in this striking image, we're told that God is a poet who wants to sing too. Your God will live among you, and he will celebrate you with songs of joy, Zephaniah says. The closing poem of the book ends with these very powerful images about God gathering up into his family the outcast and the poor and the broken, where he exalts them into a place of honor. And that's how the book ends. This little book of Zephaniah, it contains some of the most intense images of God's justice and love that you find anywhere in the prophets. His justice is about his passion to protect and to rescue his world from the horror of human evil and violence. God won't tolerate the horrible things that humans do to each other and to his world. But he brings his justice in order to restore, in order to create a world where people can flourish in safety and peace because of his love. And so Zephaniah forces us to hold together these two aspects of God's character, his justice and his love. And he wants us to discover that together they contain the future hope of our world. And that's what the book of Zephaniah is all about. Right. Well, he touches on several of the verses that uh, I was going to uh, mention just uh, just briefly here. Look at, because we still want to go on through uh, Haggai. Uh, go to... We have this again, verse 7, be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. Uh, day of the Lord numerous times throughout Scripture, so don't just think of Jesus' return. It's when God acts decisively in, in history, but this be silent. Uh, okay, screen, yeah, we're still sharing. So be silent before the Lord, like we saw in, in Psalms and Habakkuk. And then go on uh, to... Here, verse 3, chapter 2, he mentions it. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Um, so, seek the Lord, you humble. And then seek humility. So, find ways to humble ourselves before the Lord. Not a false humility, but as I've mentioned numerous times, my dad being a bigger man, 6'5", one way that he has sought humility is 
throughout life, he's often, not every single time, but often kneels when he prays. And he said, that's just one way that I can humble myself before God. Uh, we've got to have a true humility uh, in us. Now, what I did, I need to turn off that, optimize for video. Uh, so see humility. And then uh, you go on into three, move on down so I can get to it. Uh, <clears throat> down here in verse nine, there's hope and unity. Then I will purify the lips of the people. They may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. So there's hope of what God will do. He has not abandoned us and that we are united with brother, other brothers and sisters in Christ. We serve him shoulder to shoulder. Psalm 1, oh, oh, I should know that always. 130, 131, how sweet it is. 133, how sweet it is when brothers dwell together in unity. For there, the Lord bestows his blessing. That doesn't mean we all need to be meeting in one church, under one church name. What we're doing here, coming together from different church backgrounds, is a beautiful picture of Unity, unity in the midst of diversity. Unity does not mean uniformity, that we all look, think, smell, and act just alike. No, it's unity in the midst of diversity. God is diverse. His people, people from every tribe, language, people, and nation, four or five times in Revelation. Uh, Jesus' coat of many colors is complete when it's made up of people from every people group. You know, not one ethnicity only. So we serve him. So what this is, this is unity. What we do here, come together under the Lordship of Christ, to study God's written word to point us to his living word. Uh, that's unity. And that he loves that and he can bestow. And I think that's one of the reasons in something like, I'm not saying SHBI is the only one, but that's a reason in, in undertakings like SHBI, where we come together with brothers and sisters from different backgrounds that we we find some sweetness from the Lord there, his spirit present, because he promises us that where there is unity among my people, there I will bestow my blessing. I will grace them with my spirit. Uh, that is all. And well, no, 17, he mentioned all of these verses, two, three, that one, three, nine, and then 317. Have you thought about this one much? The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. And again, keep in mind that is plural too. It's not just me individually, you plural, corporately. But God is with us. And do we think about that, that he takes great delight in us? We often tend to use language more about maybe he's put out with us, but no, he takes great delight. And he will rejoice. He rejoices over us with singing. So I keep that imagery in mind some too, whenever I'm in my time with him, that he delights, he loves for us to be with him. Well, I can't really pause much because I want to move on and finish Haggai. And we're going to do it with the video uh, because it just gives us the best quick synopsis of the book because we see things going on in the book that uh that i would fail to just bring out myself so it'll leave us next week doing zechariah and malachi there's a number of important verses in each of those especially zechariah it's a little bit longer but i think we can do it next week uh so Haggai. the book of the prophet Haggai. It's one of the smaller prophetic books, but crucially important in the overall story of the Hebrew Bible. So for centuries, the Hebrew prophets had been accusing Israel of breaking their covenant with God through idolatry and injustice. And they warned that God would send the great empire of Babylon to take out Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and haul off the people into exile. And it all happened in the year 587 BC. But that wasn't the end of the story. The prophets also believed that there was still hope and that God would one day bring back a transformed remnant of his people Israel to live in a new Jerusalem where God's presence would live in their midst. 
Now, when we turn to Haggai, the year is 520 BC, nearly 70 years after the exile. And the Babylonian Empire has recently collapsed, and the world is now ruled by the Persians. Now, they allowed the return of any exiled Israelites who wanted to go back to Jerusalem, which still lay in ruins. And so, under the leadership of a high priest named Joshua, and Zerubbabel, an heir from the line of David, and a group of exiles, they all returned and began to rebuild the city and their lives. Remember the story from the book of Ezra, chapters 1 to 6. So our hopes are high and the future seems very bright, but it's not actually, at least from Haggai's point of view. The book consists of four sections that summarize Haggai's message given to the people of Jerusalem over the course of four months. He opens by accusing the people of misplaced priorities. And so, yes, they have come back to Jerusalem, but they're spending all of their time and resources rebuilding their own fancy houses, while the temple still lay in ruins from its destruction from 70 years ago. So Haggai asks, are your own houses really more important than your allegiance to God? This neglect, Haggai says, is tantamount to the covenant rebellion of their ancestors, which is why the land is still unproductive, why they've been struck with famine and drought. And here Haggai's quoting from the list of covenant curses in the book of Deuteronomy. And so Haggai's challenging words, they're followed by a story of the people's response. Remember also the story in Ezra chapter 5. We're told that Zerubbabel, Joshua, the remnant of the people were provoked by Haggai's message and they were motivated. They started rebuilding the temple. So in the next section, Haggai follows up one month later and he addresses some problems of shattered expectations among the people. So the temple that they're rebuilding is really pretty unimpressive. It's nothing compared to the glory of the temple Solomon built here some 500 years earlier. And so morale was really low for finishing the project. And so Haggai reminds the people of the great prophetic promises of the future kingdom of God and about this temple. He draws from the earlier prophets, especially Isaiah and Micah, about the new Jerusalem and that it would be the place from which God would redeem the whole world and where all nations would come and participate in God's kingdom, resulting in an era of peace. And so the temple, it plays a key role in God's plans for the future. And Haggai calls on the people to work in hope despite the disappointing circumstances. In the third section, Haggai follows up two months later with a call to covenant faithfulness, and he engages some priests in a conversation about ritual purity. Remember all the key ideas from the book of Leviticus. So he says, if someone goes and touches a dead body and becomes ritually impure or marked by death, and then they go and touch some food, is that food impure too? And the priests, knowing the book of Leviticus, say, yes, it's impure. And then Haggai turns this into a parable. He says, this is how it is with the people of Israel and what they're putting their hands to in rebuilding the temple. If the current generation doesn't humble themselves, if they don't turn from injustice and apathy, then Haggai says whatever they build with their hands, including this new temple, will be impure too. Haggai's challenge is that it's only by true repentance and covenant faithfulness that their building efforts will result in God bringing his kingdom and blessing. And so in a sense, Israel's future lay in their hands. God's waiting for his people to be faithful. And so the choice that Haggai's laying before the exiled generation, it's very similar to the challenge Moses gave the wilderness generation before entering the land. Their obedience will lead to blessing and success while faithlessness will lead to ruin. The book concludes with Haggai's summary of the future hope of God's kingdom. He's going to make the new Jerusalem the center of his glorious international kingdom. And from there, he will confront and defeat evil among the nations. He reminds people of the defeat of Pharaoh's army in the Exodus story. God will fulfill here his promise to David and establish the king from his line. And in Haggai's day, that was represented by Zerubbabel. And so the book ends with the choice of a bright future just hanging there. So the question is, will Haggai's generation be faithful to God? Will they experience the fulfillment of all these promises? And Zerubbabel, will he be faithful? Will he turn out to be the messianic king? And you have to just keep reading into the final two books of the prophets, Zechariah and Malachi, to find out. But you can see how this little book contains a great challenge to every generation of God's people, that our choices really matter and that the faithfulness and obedience of God's people is part of how God has chosen to work out his purposes in the world. And so this surprising truth should motivate humility and action in God's people as they look forward to God's coming kingdom. And that is the message of the book of Haggai. All right. He changed it up there instead of
that's what the book of Haggai is all about. Um, he did it that way. Uh, it's close to quitting time. I'm just going to say, uh, close out Zephaniah, Haggai. Uh, so I know he says 587. I'd seen it years ago, 586. So I always just have gone with 586. That's my story. And I'm sticking with it on the destruction of Jerusalem, 586, 587. But a couple of verses to look at in uh, Haggai. Um, look, he talks about because of their disobedience, you know, he uses an analogy that we can relate to. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have you feel. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages. You put them in a purse with holes in it. Uh, and of course, that can happen to people's retirement plans. And, and it doesn't mean, say, someone was with Enron, uh, you know, years ago. And then they, with all of their abuse, corruption, uh, you know, the retirement for so many people was uh, decimated. Well, that's not a reflection on, that's not a judgment on the individuals. Of course, that's a, a greater a corporation, the greed of a corporation. Uh, but that's the principle there, that uh, if, if we don't have God in the middle of our lives, uh, what we're looking for will never satisfy. It's like Augustine says, you know, that our hearts are restless till they find their rest in him. We feel that God shaped cold in our lives. Look at chapter two, and then we'll stop. I got to have a couple of minutes before going into Revelation. Uh, God's presence with them, Emmanuel, even at that time, uh, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains among you. Don't be afraid. Look how consistent that is. Emmanuel, God with us. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. My spirit is with you. Verse six, seven, I will shake the nations and what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory. So that is happening today. I pray that that just gets embedded in your mind. That's what God is doing today. God's house, do not think of any you know, physical structure in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. God's house of nations is being filled with people, whether in the, the, the darkest, the, the deep jungle of Papua New Guinea, or whether it's in Iran, wherever in the, in the most oppressive in the world, North Korea, this house, uh, the desire of the nations is coming to his house. And nine, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. So what God is doing in bringing people from all nations today is greater glory than the beautiful temple of Solomon because it's no longer just temples of stone, but temples of, of people. And the glory of God's house today is greater than the glory, no matter how great it was of, of Solomon's temple or Herod's temple. Um, okay. Thank you, Cornell. This the uh, first last time to be with be with us together live. Appreciated your input. And we have one more that I guess you'll catch on YouTube. Yes, it's been a blessing studying with you as well. All of you. Well, we will stop there and have a few minutes before the next class. So I we'll look forward to seeing you all next Monday for our last class. Until then, the Lord bless you, be with you, turn his face towards you. Good night. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Yes. Thank you all. Good. Well, Bye and good well, night. Well, yes, Kirk. Thank you. Thank you. Be blessed, everybody. Thank you.